I'd just invite you to make yourselves comfortable. I know there's a kind of a turnaround, tight turnaround between the last session and this one, but um, we'd like to get started so that our speakers have plenty of time. And welcome to this Saturday morning session. We're just delighted to be able to welcome uh, Ken Budigan and Kathy Kelly for this session. Uh, the last time I saw Ken, we were being arrested together in Washington in 2007. Um, so I feel like I'm in the right place when I'm with both of them. Um, good things are going to happen, and we might have a lot of time to talk. Um, a little bit of background about each of them uh, before they speak, and then there'll be time for Q&A. Uh, Ken is a peace and justice worker, teacher, workshop facilitator, and writer. Um, has been doing so for over two decades and currently serves as Pache Bene Nonviolence Services Executive Director. Since the early 1980s, Ken has worked with numerous social movements, including movements for a nuclear free future, an end to homelessness, and freedom for East Timor. He earned his PhD in Historical and Cultural Studies of Religions at the Graduate Theological Union in 2000. He has been a lecturer in the spirituality and practice of nonviolence at the Franciscan School of Theology in Berkeley and directed the Spiritual Life Institute at St. Martin's College in Washington State for three years. He currently teaches at DePaul University and Loyola University in Chicago's Institute of Pastoral Studies. Ken has published five books, including Pilgrimage Through a Burning World, Spiritual Practice and Nonviolent Protest at the Nevada Test Site. Albany, New York, uh, 2003. Kathy Kelly coordinates Voices for Creative Nonviolence, a campaign to end US military and economic warfare. During each of nine recent trips to Afghanistan, most recently, Kathy returned in January from Afghanistan. Uh, she has lived alongside ordinary Afghan people in a working class neighborhood in Kabul uh, as an invited guest of the Af Afghan Peace Volunteers. She and her companions in Voices for Creative Nonviolence believe that where you stand determines what you see. They are resolved not to let war sever the bonds of friendship between them and Afghan people whom they've grown to know through successive delegations. Kathy and her companions lived in Baghdad throughout the 2003 shock and all bombing. They have also lived alongside people during warfare in Gaza, Lebanon, Bosnia, and Nicaragua. She was sentenced to one year in federal prison for planting corn on nuclear missile silo sites, 1988 to 89, and spent three months in prison in 2004 for crossing the line at Fort Benning's military training school. As a war tax refuser, she has refused payment of all forms of federal income tax since 1980. So. Thank you for being with us. And I'll turn it over to you, Ken. Thanks, Margaret. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So as Margaret mentioned, I work with Pace Bene, which means peace and goodness, peace and justice, peace and well-being. We're an outfit started by the Franciscan Friars in California 22 years ago. We've done about 700 workshops on active and creative, challenging, audacious, nonviolent change. And um, it's a phrase that St. Francis and St. Clair used 800,000 years ago in a society that faced a lot of violence, economic injustice, poverty. And it was a, an uncommon phrase in those days to, to actually wish peace, to give a greeting of peace to someone else. And so they concocted that, and everywhere they went, they used that. And I'm told that. If you're walking down the streets in Italy today, if you say pace bene to someone, they will say bene pace uh, to you. So as we begin our session this morning, I'm going to invite us to say that pace bene. Let's say pace bene together. Pace bene. Pace bene. Pace bene. Pace bene. Pace bene. So we have been exploring over the last couple of days what does it mean to be that pace bene, to be that peace and justice, and using this amazing gift, this kairos gift that we receive, the pace minteris? 
And in reflecting on St. Francis, and we're reflecting on St. Francis more these days, given our new pope, St. Francis uh, is named, uh, gives his name to the city of San Francisco, California, where I lived for many years. And in the 1990s, a beautiful city, San Francisco, lovely city by the, by the bay, a very wealthy city, 16,000 homeless people on any given night had no place to sleep. Uh, 1,400 shelter beds. The answer of the city of St. Francis was to criminalize the homeless. It was to say if you're sleeping in a doorway, if you're sleeping in a park, if you're sleeping on a sidewalk, then you are criminal. And people were uh, arrested and given uh, citations and fines of $78 every time they slept in a doorway. I don't know about you, I would find it difficult spending $78 each night for my sleeping. And these were homeless people and those tickets accumulated. And uh, eventually some of those homeless people ended up going to jail because they could not pay their fines. So 45 uh, mosques, uh, synagogues, and Catholic and Protestant churches came together and formed something called Religious Witness with Homeless People. And we just started asking, what do we do? And as we reflected on that, and I'm, I'm gathering and I'm assuming that a lot of us have also been in those situations. What do we do in the face of injustice and violence, especially structural violence? It says some are more important than others. Well, we, uh, we did what Gandhi did. Don, Gandhi would sit in a room and wait uh, for the answer. Uh, we'd light a candle and wait. And what came to us a couple of times were, were these ideas. First of all, uh, if homeless people are going to be arrested for sleeping in public, then we have to sleep in public also. And so we went to these really wonderful parks, Golden Gate Park, uh, Union Square, which is downtown San Francisco, and uh, we'd roll out our sleeping bags night after night, and two o'clock after the late local news was over, the local police would troop into the park and, and, and put us under arrest, uh, say, uh, leave now, and we'd say, well, we can't leave until uh, we have justice for our, for our sisters and brothers. We did that night after night. We also uh, said, what about this eating in public thing? Isn't that a, uh, a violation of the kinds of principles of Catholic social teaching that we've been looking at very closely the last couple of days. And so we decided to, um, uh, to do, in a sense, what another group, Food Not Bombs, had been doing. They, they get a big uh, uh, canister of soup and start ladling it out to people in some of the parks. And they were being arrested for that, as well as the homeless people being arrested for eating in public. Uh, but we said, no, when we read our scriptures, it talks about a banquet where we all sit and eat till we're full and drink till we're happy. And we decided, let's build a banquet. Let's set a banquet. Let's have this most amazing food in San Francisco that day. In any restaurant, this was going to be better. We, we decided we would have uh, 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 linen tablecloths and uh, cut flowers and wonderful uh, goblets and beautiful silverware. And we would have uh, uh, three risers with uh, choirs that would be singing. And we went about that, 45 religious communities coming together across the lines of faith and, and organized this. The problem was we were trying to be Gandhian. We were trying to follow also in the footsteps of Jesus and be totally transparent in our action. So we, uh, of course, let the police know. We let the city know. We let the media know. And when we got there, we saw a huge number of uh, uh, city police. And we had decided to do this in the most verboten part of the city, which was in Civic Center Plaza, which is right in front of City Hall. That's where most people had been arrested. And so we arrived, and we sent a group of some of the uh, religious leadership that was with us to go to talk to the police, to kind of explain what we were doing. They trooped over and talked to the officers there. And while they were doing that, we pulled these trucks in, and we pulled these tables off, and we put these uh, uh, linen tablecloths on, and we set this amazing meal. And homeless people 
having, because we had worked for several weeks inviting them to this meal, uh, had arrived, but they were lining up like they do at any kind of soup kitchen. We said, oh, um, we invite you to, to sit at this table. And we had the most amazing experience. We also made a dent in that policy, uh, sleeping in public and then taking uh, a banquet together, uh, got huge uh, press in the area. We created the conditions that it wasn't just a witness and it wasn't just a momentary banquet. We tried to do what social movements do, alert, educate, win, and mobilize the populace to ask, what are our values? What are our values? Is there common good? Can we uh, respect the dignity of human beings? And the resounding answer from the city was yes. And moved the power holders off their position, and that program was dismantled. That program, that uh, systematic criminalization in San Francisco was, was dismantled. And in fact, the district attorney publicly shredded something like 58,000 tickets that had, been, that had been issued to homeless people. Well, I suppose if we had a week, we could go around and share so many amazing nonviolent actions that are not just witnesses, but actually help to do uh, what Dr. King, as he described nonviolence, as the love that does justice. It's not just love and it's not just justice, it's the love that does justice. That was his definition of nonviolence. We could go around this room, I'm sure we could spend maybe a month sharing uh, those examples of, of nonviolent action. One of the reasons we're here today is to affirm and to celebrate and lift our glass to Pachaman Terrace for many actions over the last half century, like the one I just described, have flowed from that amazing document rooted in the vision and power unleashed by John the 23rd 50 years ago next month. This vision and power flowed from Pachaman Terrace's deeply prophetic stance. But as we'll explore, this stance was not simply a form of homiletics or even only an act of reading the signs of the times. I think it's very helpful to think of Pachaman Terrace as inspiring nonviolent action, as encouraging and being rooted in the experience of nonviolent action. Uh, it knew what it was talking about. It did not come out of nothing or out of thin air. It came out of nonviolent action. And that since 1963, Pacham and Terrace has been a form of nonviolent action that has been prodding us, that has been encouraging us, that has been inspiring us. That action did not end with the issuing of Pacham and Terrace on Holy Thursday, 1963. It's operating now and it's inviting us to go further. Finally, Pacham and Terrace challenges us, interrogates us, inspires us to take action to take the next step. One of those might be to call our church at this Kairos moment of extreme violence, but also I believe a Kairos moment of monumental nonviolence that is happening in this country and around the world in a new way than even 50 years ago, to call on the church to undergo a profound formation process in gospel nonviolence, to center itself even more thoroughly than ever in the nonviolence of Jesus for the transformation of our lives, our church, and our world. So very briefly, we're by now very um, familiar with this nonviolent action that Pope John XXIII took at the, at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, where a, uh, a, an advisor to the Pope was at a gathering of Soviet and, and American academics and people who wanted to see a way through the the Cold War, and this happened right when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. And this advisor said, I could talk to John XXIII about this. Would this be helpful? And they seized on it, and they got to the White House, and there was a lot of back and forth. There's a lot that went on in the, in the back channels and created the conditions for John to issue a very, very strong statement we beg all governments not to remain deaf to this cry of humanity. That they do this is in their power to save peace. Thus, will they, thus they will spare the world from the horrors of a war whose terrifying consequences no one 
can predict. With his plea, Pope John gave Khrushchev, premier and Soviet premier, a way out. By withdrawing now, he would be seen as a person of peace, not a coward. Two days later, Khrushchev, an atheist who was in the middle of a propaganda war with the Vatican, agreed to withdraw the missiles, and Kennedy also secretly agreed to withdraw American missiles from, from Turkey. Although he was dying of cancer, John XXIII continued to play a key role in fostering peace between the two global antagonists at that time. In a book later published by Cousins, Norman Cousins, who had helped organize that, that little gathering, he quotes John Paul, I mean Pope John, as saying, world peace is humankind's greatest need. I am old, but I will do what I can in the time I have left. Part of this doing included writing Pachamenteras. This process of creating the document began in November of 1962. So I'm suggesting that we use the lens of nonviolent action for this particular intervention. It's a plea, yes. It's a document, yes. It's a hope, yes. But I would say it's also a nonviolent action that teaches us about how to respond in small ways and, and large ways. It's illuminating to uh, look at the options. The Pope, Pope could have done nothing. He could have simply railed against or even anathematized one side or the other or both. Instead, he actively put the weight of the church, not behind fiery denunciation of the parties, but behind an invitation for both sides to give up their individual truth for a larger truth beyond the inexorable escalatory violence of the live nuclear threat. As Angelo Roncalli, he had played many peacemaking, peacemaking roles as priest, papal nuncio, and bishop, both before and during World War II. But his most powerful and most recent peacemaking venture was the back channel role he played during the Cuban crisis. It is fruitful to think that Pachamenteras is not simply a declaration on peace, but an act of peacemaking. Just as Jesus calls on his disciples to put down his sword in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Monsignor Romero, as we heard last night, pleaded with Salvadoran soldiers to put down their guns, John XXIII had called on the Soviet Union and the United States to put down the most fearsome swords and guns in human history. And by doing so, models for us, teaches for us, urges us to do likewise in whatever situation, whatever venue, whatever context we're in. But there's also another nonviolent action. That's a very monumental nonviolent action. But there's also one, a very um, under the radar nonviolent action that also happened at that time that I'd like to draw attention to. To prepare for the opening of the Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII issued an encyclical entitled Penedentium Agere. This papal letter was a call for Catholics worldwide to undertake spiritual preparation in the months before the council began in October of 1962, including engaging in works of mercy and both internal and outward acts of penance. One Catholic who was inspired by the encyclical was Lonzo Del Vasto. Del Vasto lived and worked with Gandhi in India for six months in 1936. Gandhi gave him a new name, Shantidas, or Servant of Peace. Eventually, he returned to Europe to found a Gandhian order in the West, which he called the Community of the Ark, located in southern France. Like Gandhi, the community mounted numerous nonviolent action campaigns rooted in faith, rooted in spirituality, including resisting the French war in Algeria, nuclear weapons, torture, conscription, and the extension of a military base in southern France. In response to the Pope's encyclical calling for spiritual preparation, Del Vasto traveled to Rome in March 1963 for perhaps his greatest nonviolent action, which he recounts in a book published several years later entitled uh, Warriors of Peace, writings on the techniques of nonviolence. Apparently unaware that Pachamenteras was being written at the time, he sent a letter to the Pope and respectfully invited him to considering e issuing a statement on peace. Del Vasto explained that he would be uh, undertaking an unp unpublicized hidden fast for 40 days during Lent at a time, as a time of prayer and repentance 
but also as a spiritual support and silent encouraging presence for John the 23rd to issue a message of peace the world, uh, to the world that would be, quote, bold, absolute, in short, evangelical. Del Vasto's 40-day fast was not a hunger strike. It was not a confrontation. It was not a petition. It was not a manifesto. Conducted in an out-of-the-way Cistercian monastery, it was a spiritual practice in which presence opened to presence in silence and hope. Like all deeply nonviolent action, it sought to support and nourish and encourage the longing for peace, justice, and the well-being in the other. Del Vasto offered his own silent fasting body like a tiny candle in the darkness of those times, not as a reproach or a demand, but as a point of light, of intention, and constancy. He invited the Pope to, to have some part of his consciousness aware that someplace this person was doing this 40-day fast in support of this kind of, of action. In his later letter to Pope John, Del Vasto made two key points. In the midst of the terror of the, quote, mad logic of our, our times, which could touch off nuclear dis destruction maliciously or accidentally, it is the church's role to, quote, warn, exhort, implore, and show, show, show the way out. But this will carry no weight if the church ultimately functions as an accomplice of armed governments. Unless the church is free to resist systems of violence and injustice, its plea for peace will only amount to empty rhetoric and uh, empty and alienating rhetoric. The church and its members must be willing to break with government authority when its policies contravene the law of God, including the law not to kill. For Del Vasto, the perennial theological stumbling block in our tradition was Romans 13, which makes a religious duty of blind obedience to established power, as he put it. He challenges what he calls the misinterpretation of Paul's passage by stressing that our allegiance is to God and, and not to men. Anticipating the argument that this will lead to anarchy, Del Vasto urges not rebellion or subversion, but what he calls spiritual resistance, or what he defines elsewhere as active nonviolence. At the end of his letter, he says that I have gone into seclusion and will remain hidden. Only a few friends and some dignitaries of the church know of my fast. I hope that the press will not call attention to it. Trembling but not without hope, I lay it at your uh, holiness's feet in the heart of our merciful Lord, your devoted servant, Anzo del Vasto. Now, for much of the fast, he wasn't even clear that the Pope had gotten the letter. Finally, on, on Wednesday of Holy Week, Del Vasto's wife, Chantral, visited the Vatican Secretary of State. The Monsignor with whom she met assured her that the letter had indeed been read. Then he said, and I quote, actually, I have the answer here. And he handed her the encyclical Pachamenteris, which was to be published, as we know, the next day. There are things in it that have never been said, the Monsignor said, pages that have that might have been signed by your husband. On Good Friday, a priest from the Vatican visit, visited Del Vasto and presented him with gifts from Pope John, two leather cases bearing the papal arms and containing a rosary and a medal with an accompanying message, the special prayer of the Holy Father for Del Vasto and Chantral. On Easter Sunday, Del Vasto broke his fast. When he read Pachamenteris, he found at least two themes contained in the letter that he originally had sent to John the 23rd. First, the encyclical challenges the dominant traditional interpretation of Romans 13, which held that Christians were required to render unqualified obedience to civil authority. Reflecting many of the ideas that Del Vasto developed and even sharing a phrase found in Del Vasto's letter, we must obey God rather than men, the encyclical draws on uh, St. John Chrysostom's reading of the Pauline passage to make a distinction between persons in power uh, and their mandate, which must ultimately be, be congruent with the laws of God. If there is no congruence, there is no obligation to obey or support authority. For Del Vasto, this provided a justification of civil disobedience, which would prove to have far-reaching implications for faith-based nonviolent action going forward, like what we did in San Francisco. 
More profoundly still, it meant that there was now a warrant for the church itself to withdraw its support from any order not founded, quote, on truth built on justice. For Dabasto, this cleared the way for a strong prophetic stance by the church against total war and for a world of peace and justice. Though it would be a misreading of history to give too much weight to Del Vasto's fast in the promulgation of Pachamenteros, it's intriguing that it may have helped contribute to one of its, one of its linchpins. So there are two actions, one monumental, the other very quiet. Uh, I'm convinced from my experience, each of us in this room can be involved in both kinds. And we get warrant and support and grace from a Pachamenteris to this um, possibility for us to think about how are we going to put that love that does justice into practice in light of what we're seeing in the world. I want to mention that um, for the last three years, uh, I have been part of a, an emerging group within the Archdiocese of Chicago called Catholics for Nonviolence. And Catholics for Nonviolence immediately responded to the, and, and emerged from the amazing and horrific violence that's happening, especially youth violence in, in Chicago. Uh, it was uh, exacerbated this week with the announcement that 129 schools are going to be closed in Chicago, uh, mostly in uh, low-income communities and mostly um, students of color are going to be disproportionately uh, affected by that. Uh, Catholics for Nonviolence is uh, attempting to see how can we pool our people power? How can we deepen our awareness that we're even called to gospel nonviolence to respond to that kind of violence that's going on, both the immediate violence of that kind of youth on youth violence, but also the structural violence of poverty, racism, sexism, homophobia, all the forms of violence structural violence that help create these kinds of situations. What we're trying to do are a few things, and I just want to lift those up for you. One is um, we're trying to spread the word that gospel nonviolence, that that love that does justice, is at the heart of Jesus' message. I was just in a session where uh, it said that uh, peace building is the best kept secret of Catholic social teaching. Well, that's true in our churches and not just in this conference. Uh, so we're inviting parishes to become nonviolent communities, uh, to go through a formation process that assesses in what ways are we nonviolent and what ways aren't we? How are we putting the gospel message of nonviolence into, into practice? So last weekend, we had a, a Blessed Are the Peacemakers workshop with 70 people from across the archdiocese coming together and considering becoming facilitators of this, of this process. But not just for the, non, for the violence in our church, and there's plenty of violence in our church, and we need these resources, but also how can we each parish become a, a peace center, become a peace zone, offer resources to their neighborhoods, to their community? And then third, how do we pool the nonviolent people power from across the archdiocese to actually do what uh, movements have to do to, to tackle the structural violence of injustice, of poverty, and so on. Um, and so we talked about what does it mean to alert, educate, win, and mobilize our, our, our society? And how can we um, pull together all the, all the resources and all the possibilities and all the various projects that are happening to take a very, very strong uh, stand uh, against, against violence? I believe we're at a Kairos moment. We are incredibly gifted to be here this weekend to, to lift up what has happened over the last century, half century since the promulgation of uh, Pachamenteris. And I think we can build on that now. I think the Kairos is the, the extreme violence we face, structural violence, and not just in our cities, but of course, can we invite our country to put down its drones? Can we? invite our country to uh, not reach simply for a violent solution to uh, respond to complex uh, problems in the spirit of Pacham and Terrace. 
We're at a kairos moment. But I think it's also a kairos moment in this sense. The church in every age has grappled with questions of violence and injustice in different ways, whether that's going along with empire after the Constantinian turn, whether that's the emergence of Francis as peacemaker, whether that's the emergence of many religious orders in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries that responded to the injustice of poverty with, with charity and with walking with the poor. Um, I think we're also now at a key Kairos moment uh, when we can begin to say, based on everything that's been happening, and certainly the last 50 years, how do we put gospel nonviolence front and center? How do we put it at the heart of our liturgical experiences, our sacramental experiences, our theological experiences, our practical ministerial experiences? How do we get that identity uh, that it's not non-resistance, but it's nonviolent action that we're called to? And that it's not just a few people who can engage in this, uh, but, that, but that all of us, all of us can. We have an opportunity to even more explicitly bring the love of enemies, love of neighbor, love of selves, and the love for the nonviolent God who loves us unconditionally to build a movement of gospel nonviolence and nonviolent action in our church, in our catechesis and formation programs, in our ministries of every stripe, so that we can take action to see our parishes as nonviolent communities and our church as a nonviolent community as a resource for a world that is hurting and longing to build a more just and nonviolent society and community. Thank you. Thank you, Ken and Kathy. Thank you. you know, being from Chicago, I get a chance to meet many of the young people who have been wonderfully influenced by Ken, and so I'm very glad to be here with him on this panel. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King encouraged all of us to have tough minds and tender hearts. And being here this weekend, I feel particularly grateful to all of the people who called us together this weekend and all of the people who've given such really extraordinary input because I think it, it is characterized by that idea of tough minds and tender hearts. And I'd like just to linger a little longer on thoughts about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. When we started out, um, Father Ken pointed out that in 1962, the Cold War was going on. He took us back to that extraordinary decade. Well, you know, in 1963, September 15th, 1963, something so tragic happened. Four little girls were in a church praying in Birmingham, praying for peace in their own neighborhood. And the church was firebombed by a man who was presumably a white separatist. And so three days later, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King delivered a eulogy for A.D. May and Carol Denise and Cynthia Diane Wesley and Carol Robertson. He called them angels and princesses. And he said that these children, unoffending, innocent and beautiful, were the victims of one of the most vicious and tragic crimes ever perpetrated against humanity. He called them the martyred heroines of a holy crusade for freedom and human dignity. Now, I think the spirit of Pachaman Terrace is echoed in his eulogy. And so I stand here to say this afternoon to all assembled here that in spite of the darkness of this hour, we must not despair. We must not become bitter nor must we harbor the desire to retaliate with violence. No, we must not lose faith in our white brothers, and I'm sure he meant his white sisters as well. Somehow we must believe that the most misguided among them can learn to respect the dignity and the worth 
of all human personality. And that's painful and difficult, dark moment. I think we hear the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King invoking that spirit of Pacham and Terrace that was released and flowing all around the world, and I think all around the United States and through the civil rights movement. And we had it flowing here plenty, right here in McKenna Hall last night when Julian so skillfully and through a lifetime of dedication took us into the extraordinary and excruciatingly beautiful life of Monsignor Romero. And so we hear ourselves called to forgiveness, to empathy, to human rights, to a kind of envisioning of rights-based governance, and very importantly, to the desirability of learning from the poorest, the most impoverished in our world. The desirability and the possibility of learning from them the preferential option of the poor, but also learning. And I've been very privileged to learn from a group of teenagers. You know, I'm a high school teacher for 14 years. If anybody had ever told me, I'd fall head over heels in love with a group of teenagers who'd become my mentors when I hit 58. I, I may not have believed it, but the past three years have been quite wonderful for me in having been able to learn from the Afghan peace volunteers. I first encountered them. Um, we were doing a fast in Washington, D.C. with the Witness Against Torture group, and Bob Cook from Fox Christie said, listen, you guys, I want you to understand there are kids fasting with you in a rural province of Afghanistan called Bamiya. And we said, what? And they, well, you never read your emails. That's why you don't know. So we, <laughs> and so we had a Skype phone call. That kids had a cell phone, and we could Skype to their cell phone. And so Carmen Trotta from New York said, hey, it's Martin Luther King's birthday. Do you think I could tell these kids about Martin Luther? And we said, yeah, go ahead. And as soon as he started, there was a commotion at the other end. And it was these youngsters trying to decide which one of them would be the first to give a memorized quote from one of the speeches of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And um, I've been very, very lucky to learn from them. I think rather than me speaking about them, how about if we just get a chance to see them? And this is a three minute video, one of about 120 they've made. The quality is not so great, but please cut them slack because the electricity is not so great and the internet is almost non-existent, so it's amazing that they're able to do these. But um, this is, this is a, a quick clip of them doing something that's very common in their lives, collecting fuel. And I want to admit that when I first heard about them going out to the mountainsides to collect fuel, I thought, you know, they'd just be kind of scavenging. Take a look. <laughs>
Thank you. Uh, that's uh, Gulamai and Ali, and uh, the, the older person is Hakim that you saw in one of those last slides. And these youngsters have experienced the horrors of warfare in multiple ways. Uh, Faiz's brother was killed before his eyes. Abdullahi, when he was two years old, had to be put in a little hammock over an open flame so they could thaw him out when he was in a refugee camp. And his father was killed. Um, uh, Faiz is an orphan. Uh, Gulamai's mother um, is, is a single mom with a withered arm. And they, they have uh, many reasons to feel maybe resentment or desires for retaliation or revenge. But they have sworn off any commitment to revenge or retaliation. They say so clearly, we want to live without wars. And they really um, derive great hope from the teachings of Gandhi and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, I, so I'd like to play another video that uh, people who see this say to me, this young fellow, Zekarola, is an old soul. I, I'm not sure what exactly that means to people, but he's very wise. I wonder if the lights could go down. Call Vishore, who was the Mardun Vishore Akori? Who be asked? Mardun Bekorna, Bekori Akudish at Maradis. Smotch and Solati? Moss is a Sola. The Soli do as I know, Parsa. How Rose say who took Kustamasha? Who took Mr. Shimo? Vishore Gabby Chatty Bums. Afghanistan <laughs> و <laughs> Kadri Zindigi Dukhtari Obama. Are this Darayani? Zindigi was a bishop of Zindigi who was here, a chicky who Dukhtaria Chia Syria. Was it? Pocho. Do Kadri was this Natari? As Chin Sonibu, I called him a yak in Sana Semyak or Dama Sekula. Was there a narrow ho? Thank you. So that's Zekrola. In terms of humanity, both of us are human beings. We are all part of one another. Pachaman Terrace is alive and well and flowing through Afghanistan. But the risks are very high. Um, just in uh, the last couple of seasons, the numbers of civilians killed while doing exactly what you saw in that film uh, have um, convinced people that it's very, very unsafe to go out to the mountainsides. Uh, there were uh, in the Lagman province, eight women collecting firewood who were 
killed as they were collecting the firewood um, just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, two youngsters were killed by Australian NATO forces in an aerial strike, and uh, they were just out watching their flocks, and these kinds of stories go on and on. There's also um, the great risk because of conditions in Afghanistan being so, so harsh. Uh, about a year ago, I, I was in Afghanistan and uh, living with the Afghan peace volunteers who now live in Kabul. Uh, their mentor, Hakim, uh, was threatened with death and his house was burned down. His house was just like a, a one-room hovel, really. And uh, the, the threats seem to also extend to some of the youngsters. So Voices has rented out an apartment in Kabul and they live there and go to school, um, having a, a better chance at some education in, in Kabul. And so I get a chance to go over there. And if some of you would like to think about that, please let me know. Um, several women came to see me. And um, it was great to get to know some of the women. They came in wearing burqas and flipped back the blue veil. And um, beautiful young faces, Nuria and Nekbat and Fatima. And each of them told me in one way or another that she was experiencing mental distress. Fatima said, I think I am losing my mind. Nuria said, I feel like I'm going mad. And Nekpat said, I'm becoming mentally unstable. And I asked, well, what's wrong? And the answer was the same for all three, a kind of shame-faced, almost guilt-ridden and tearful statement I cannot feed my family. And so I asked, well, what do you have to eat? And the answer was the same for each one, stale bread and tea without sugar. You see, the economic sanctions against Iran have caused the price of wheat to go up in Afghanistan, and these women had no buffer. The Afghan peace volunteers heard these cries also, and so they decided to make their space available to the women to form a sewing co-op. And so through these women, I've been able to learn so, so much about their lives and about the lives of people who are much worse off than them. They started sewing duvets, the heavy blankets that the poorest of people need. You see, there are 35,000 refugees living in the snow, living rough, living, sleeping out more or less in Afghanistan. And it gets to be so, so very cold. In January of 2012, 100 people froze to death, and 26 of them were children in Kabul. And eight of them were children in a refugee camp I visited frequently. And one of them was the child of Jumagul, Ishmael. He'd only been alive for 30 days. And when I first met that family, I sat down next to the little girl. It was so cold, I huddled next to this, this little girl for warmth. And then her uncle came over and unzipped the top of her jacket and pulled the jacket aside so that I'd see that she was missing an arm. It was a drone attack that forced this family from the Sanjin district of the Helmand province to flee. And 400 people flee every single day, according to Amnesty International. The war displaces 400 people a day who then come to cities that have no place for them. And right now in Afghanistan, one out of every 11 women dies in childbirth, a tortuous way to die. One out of five children doesn't make it beyond the age of five. The UN says this is the worst place in the world into which a child can be born. And yet somehow we're sort of coached to think that our warfare, which costs $2 billion per week, $1 million per soldier per year, is a a war that's going to protect women and children. But the women and children I meet don't even begin to suggest that. And there's almost a certain madness that seems to prevail in this war. And it's not the madness that the women said they were feeling because of not being able to feed their children. It's a, it's a madness of sorts that was summed up by an Italian hospital worker I know. Emmanuel Nanini, and he's, he's a, got a wry sense of humor, and these Italian hospitals are some of the best you could ever imagine, and I have O negative blood, so they're always glad to see me, and I go over and pump until the blood bag is filled and, and hear from them. And um, one of the things that was said was, uh, you know, uh, allora, uh, 
you, one million dollars for your soldiers per year. Just uh, maybe you send six of them home and give, uh, give us this one million dollars. What, what we do? Well, what they could do would be quite remarkable. They'd be able to, uh, as they put it, uh, spend, uh, that would be their entire operating budget for 33 existing clinics and hospitals. And if we sent 60 soldiers home, the money saved could mean running 330 clinics. There's another dimension to this idea of madness, though, that I'd like to mention. Um, one is just very practical. Do you know it has cost as much as 400 to $800 to fill one gallon of gasoline in an airborne or a landborne vehicle in Afghanistan? Now, how could that be? Well, again, in my teaching career, I used to teach the Harrison Gents and the Latin Kings, and if I looked out my corner window, I could see all kinds of drug negotiations going on the street below, and people kind of rent out corners. Well, 93% of the world's opium comes from Afghanistan, and um, it's the largest exporter of marijuana in the world. So drug lords have tremendous power over large stretches of territory and the roadways. Now, you'd think some of those drones might notice convoys of all those drugs going away. We don't hear about that. But the United States has been paying the drug lords and the warlords in order to use the roadways. There's no other way they can deliver truck-based supplies, and they're all truck-based supplies to the United States troops. And so that's one of the reasons that U.S. taxpayers have been spending $2 billion per week to maintain the occupation. There's a sprawling refugee camp, the Chari Kamba refugee camp, that's home to the Jumagul family. It's right across the road from a much, much, much larger United States military base. And you watch the convoys go into the base all day long, delivering food and fuel and clean water. And right now, the United Nations is very alarmed because one million Afghan children are suffering from acute malnourishment, and a third of the country doesn't have any access to potable water. So tough minds and tender hearts. There's a man named Neil Shea who writes for the American Scholar. It's not a particularly left-oriented magazine, really. But he embedded himself with US troops with a squadron that he fictitiously named the Destroyers. And he wrote about what it was like to be with those troops. He, he had a lot of sympathy for the soldiers, really. That's been something he's been doing for some time, embedding himself with the US military. But in the spring of 2012, this is what he wrote. He talked about observing soldiers who talked about how their house searches had become demolition parties. They shattered windows in China, broke furniture, hurled civilians to the ground. Earlier that day, they had blown up a building. They tornadoed through Afghan houses and left such destruction that their Afghan National Army allies at first tried to stop them, then grew angry and sullen. In writing about a US staff sergeant who was in charge of this fictitiously named group, the Destroyers, the staff sergeant said, yeah, we definitely made some Taliban out here. It was like a week-long Taliban recruiting drive, and we had fun doing it. I love recruiting for the Taliban. It's called job security. Tough minds, tender hearts. Tender hearts for every returning veteran from Afghanistan, including the man who just said this. Tender hearts. But tough minds, what in the world are we doing? with our wars. Yes, yes, we must always seek peace building, but not allow ourselves to be bamboozled into the marketing of wars that are called humanitarian wars. There's no such thing as a humanitarian war. These young Afghan teenagers have been able through Skype phone calls to talk with youngsters from war zones and other places. And so I was so pleased they were able to talk with my young friend Anis from Gaza and after they heard about Anis's situation, they said to him, I mean, their geography isn't so great, they said, Anis, if war comes again, run. Run as fast as you can. And Anis in Gaza said, where would I run to? 
I met Anis when I was in Gaza during the 2009 Operation Cast Lead. It had started December 22nd, I'm sorry, December 28th of 2008, and it continued on for 22 days. And Anis found housing for me when I was able to cross into Gaza before it, the bombing had ended. Once every 11 minutes, a bomb exploded. And I'm no ballistic experts, missiles expert, but even I began to know, well, that was fired by a Hellfire, that was a Hellfire missile fired by an Apache helicopter. That was a 500 pound bomb dropped from an F-16. And the reason I was able to make the distinctions was because the children taught me the differences. And when the bombing ended, Anis took me to the Al-Shifa hospital. And there I met doctors who talked about trying to work with patients burned by white phosphorus, work with patients who'd had their limbs lacerated with dense inert metal explosion bombs. He was telling me that they really didn't know all that had been used against them, just they knew that no nation on earth had tried to help them. And then it turned out he was from a neighborhood one block away from my own neighborhood. And I said, Dr. Said Abul Hassan, when I go back to the United States, what message should I bring? And he said, well, we don't have prostheses, we don't have medicines yet. And then he stopped himself. He said, just you tell people in my neighborhood and your neighborhood this. American taxpayers are paying for these weapons. I said, it's a tall order, but I'll try to bring that message home. And so the preferential option for the poor, the chance to listen and to learn from those who bear the brunt of our wars of choice, from those who bear the brunt of the fact that our economy is so predicated on weapons and on war. And we've even got a war against the poor in our own country. And that's why our prisons are so full. And read Marge's book, hyper-incarceration is the apt word. But we don't have to be this way. We can change. It's the best vocation imaginable to be a peacemaker to be a peace builder, to be infused with and guided by the words of Pacham and Terrace. And we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses right here in this room, to be infused and guided by the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Tough minds, tender hearts. And I suppose the greatest animator is the one that uh, the greatest animating virtue is the one that Jesus entrusted to us and that will always resurrect. You can't kill the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. You can't kill Oscar Romero. You can't kill love. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And we have some time now for uh, questions. And uh, there are live mics on either side, so please approach one of the mics so that we can record your question. Thank you very much for your presentations. My name is Tim Broyles, and I'm a teacher at Brophy Prep in Phoenix, a Jesuit high school for boys. Kathy, I want to publicly thank you for putting us at Brophy in touch with the kids. Uh, with Hakeem and his group um, and sharing some conversations via Skype over the last couple of years uh, has meant a great deal uh, to the young, young men at Brophy. Uh, for them to be able to see the face uh, or hear the, hear the words of these young people was um, an incredible experience for them, that, a really transformative experience for them. Um, I lived in El Salvador uh, at the end of the war and have continued to be in solidarity uh, with young people in northern Morasan province up near the Honduran border. Um, and the challenges that these young people face uh, for getting an education are so often insurmountable, incredibly difficult challenges. I find myself um, wondering how is there hope? I, I lived on the U.S.-Mexico border in, in Ciudad Juarez where the big drug war uh, happened. And, uh, 
you know, there were 300 maquiladoras there, and the people that work in the maquiladoras live in cardboard shacks with no running water and electricity. And, and there didn't seem to be any resolution there. I'm looking for, um, people say, you know, the, the hope is among the people, and you, you, you attain hope or you experience hope through your contact with the people and who happen to be very poor. I agree with that, but it seems day in and day out that they continue to be oppressed, to be killed, um, to be exploited. We seem to be losing the battle in so many ways for justice, for love. Where is the hope for you, for the two of you? Thank you. Mm. Well, thank you, Tim. It may not sound at all commensurate to the needs that you've been laying out, but I think education, education, education. I think that people in the United States have those tender hearts and the tough minds, but they don't always hear about the needs um, that are so prevalent all throughout the world. Uh, so, you know, every pulpit, every classroom, every research project possible, I think this is part of, part of the answer. Uh, and certainly people that I've met in desperately oppressed situations say what they need for their children to break out of poverty is education. But um, what you're doing at Brophy is, is, the, is the answer. I don't mean to say that you can't retire someday, but uh, I, I really do um, speak with deepest respect to all the, the many varied educators and um, students that are in this room. I think that that is a vocation. Um, but I also think that um, we, when, we, when I say we learn from those who are impoverished, I mean, I, when I come back to the United States, you know how long it takes me to adjust to having electricity? Eight seconds. <laughs> Bam, I'm home. <laughs> Recharge everything, turn on the lights, forget to turn them off. I, you know, and I've, this video is very real to me, but we, we do all of us have the capacity to live more simply, to share our resources more radically, and to prefer service to dominance. So one thing I would suggest is, you know, find the Catholic worker house in your neighborhood and, you know, hang out there. Those are wonderful places in which to, to learn and change and grow. I, I would also add, uh, we're coming to a crossroads. Some of us are already at that crossroads, like these young people we've just experienced. Um, thank you for bringing them to us today. We're coming to the crossroads. And um, when I'm at the crossroads, I want to be there with people I love and trust. We have gone through training, that we have pooled our people power. And whether that's on the monumental level of foreign policy, we absolutely, we absolutely need a spiritually grounded movement that transforms that. And also things like the violence that's happening in our neighborhoods and the root causes of that. There is a movement that's coming, and we can all be part of it. And I would piggyback on what Kathy's saying about the importance of education. Are we getting our vision? Are we getting our toolbox? Are we finding each other? Are we building the network? Are we, are we creating a movement? How do we fit what we've heard today into what we're already doing? And then how do we find one another? It's coming. And we need to, um, as you've been stressing, the two hands of nonviolence. I will not cooperate with this injustice, uh, but I'm open to you as a human being. I invite us uh, after this conference to um, deepen our own training and then uh, find others. Um, I joined the peace movement because of the issues, but I stayed because of the cranky and beautiful people that I met there. And, we need to find those people. Hi, Father James. Uh, I thank both of the speakers and your sharing, very powerful, from San Francisco and also in Afghanistan. <clears throat> My question is, uh, uh, it's wonderful that we are talking about peace on Earth. It's wonderful we are promoting uh, 
uh, solidarity with the others. But my question is what to do where there is a religiously motivated violence mm -hmm. in so many countries, so many situations. You go to Iraq, you go to Iran, you, you go to Afghanistan, you go to Pakistan, you go to India. Uh, there is so much uh, religiously motivated violence. And Pakistan Christians who are a tiny minority, every day they confront uh, discrimination and persecution. And uh, they are so fragile. And so just by the, because they are Christians, they are made victims of violence. Their lives are at threat. And just on the 9th of March, 170 houses of Christians in Lahore, they were burned to ashes, gone with the wind. I wonder, I mean, is there any way the, there are so many uh, important scholars here, human rights activists here, promoters of peace here, Pache Ebene. But what to do with those people? Can we come with some a statement that we can help the world to become a more humane, where there is respect for relig religion, where there is respect for religious freedom? Is there a way that this forum can express solidarity or help those Christians who are suffering, who lose their lives, who lose their property, whose houses are burnt? It will be our uh, uh, solidarity with the universal church. Can we write to the embassies of these countries that they should, be, they should not violate human rights and religious freedom? Is there a way to help those poor Christians, vulnerable Christians, in these countries, like Pakistan, where they can stand uh, and they, they can rebuild their homes? And they, they, they have very firm faith. Their faith is like a rock which cannot be shaken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just put this question to both of you. Father James, when you presented two days ago, um, you've moved me very, very much when, when you said that your country, the Christians in your country, must accept being the cross-carrying Christians. Uh, I, I only know to say I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so very sorry. I had a chance to visit Christians in Islamabad um, and see that they're, they're, you're right. They're not going to be shaken. And, and uh, one was a cab driver, and he had the rosary beads dangling from the rearview mirror. And I was thinking, you want to take those down? <laughs> because really, Christians are not treated well at all. Uh, but he kept those rosary beads right where he had placed them. Um, I, I, I also want to say that um, sometimes I think the national religion here is shopping. <laughs> and that uh, to maintain our capacity to consume recklessly and wildly, we often have said to people in other parts of the world, if you don't subordinate yourselves to suit our national interests, we might eliminate you. And I think that when Pervez Musharraf was the president of your country during what are sometimes called the Bush-Mush years, eight, $11 billion was given in aid to Pakistan, and $8 billion of it was spent on the military. And then the military in Pakistan went ahead and was able to scoop up the pharmaceutical industry, the textile industry, wide swaths of land, and um, to gain great power. And I, I think that sometimes the feuding and the violent feuding that goes on between undereducated people who are perhaps persuaded that they're fulfilling a religious duty uh, is exacerbated by poverty. So the one thing that I think we, we should be saying is how can we help Pakistan and India and Afghanistan and Iraq and others that are um, receiving military aid from the United States or have received such, how can we help pay reparations? Pay reparations for suffering caused when we built up the military at the expense of those who are hungry and as I 
Eisenhower said, ought to be fed. And in, in addition to that, structural reality also defined ways of solidarity, mm -hmm. uh, like you're asking for. I would also say that um, I don't know about shopping be, being the religion, but I think the myth of redemptive violence is our, is our religion. And uh, that we're taught that violence saves us. And we're, we're taught that from very early on, not just in this country, but lots of places. And um, I, I do think that um, the, the answers to all of these questions are going to include politics, religion, culture, and movements. And ultimately, it's, spirit, it's a spiritual practice. And that spiritual practice is, how do I identify the way that the belief system in violence has so, even in those of us who are sensitive and new age and really very progressive and so on, if we are, uh, that religion of violence is very deep in us. And it's going to take some real, not just thinking and uh, reframing our beliefs, it's going to take acting our way into thinking in a, in, a, in a different way. But that would include solidarity. Um, I think we have time for just one more question before the break. So, uh, Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for today. I'm still uh, shaking. It was such a harrowing uh, tale that both of you told. Um, of a lot of the activity that you both did. Um, my name's uh, Dylan, I'm a student over at Holy Cross College, and uh, I'm kind of hoping to be one of those educators that you guys are uh, hoping for in the world. Um, so uh, I uh, hope to uh, do proud by you. Um, my question is to you, uh, with a lot of the modern media that's coming out, and not just, um, not just news stations, but with uh, movies and uh, video games and even uh, literature nowadays, um, how can we as Christians possibly combat these, these powerhouses that are promulgating um, uh, a, a war and violence in our side of the story, but we, we don't see things like this. Like This is very surprising to me, um, even, as, even as a pacifist and somebody who's been studying liberation theology, this is something that I, I don't ever see. How can we possibly combat this um, and uh, combat the media? Hmm. Well, thank you, Dylan. Um, I, if you're ever in a down mood, there are 120 of those three-minute videos. <laughs> and uh, so please, just go to a website called Our Journey to Smile. Uh, I think that um, pursuing independent media in some ways is, is made easier because of the internet, and yet um, I'll just hold up as an extremist example something I loved, um, young people feeling a lot of what you were just articulating in, in my own neighborhood uh, decided to do a one month long electricity fast. They fasted from electricity, they just unplugged, and it's, it's been very instructive to see, how well Chicago's so cold, who needs a refrigerator? They just put the food out on the back porch, but um, <laughs> Uh, so, so maybe thinking of you know dramatic actions like the one that Ken described with the San Francisco banquet, and um, you know the spirit of a university once it's put to you know creative activity is is just amazing what people come up with. So, I think uh, the long pause, slowing down, trying to think our way carefully and attentively through these situations that we face, um, but maybe um, always looking for that kind of spirited action moment. The other thing, I forgive me for cliches, but the 60s came out of the 50s, and um, there wasn't much in the, that decade of the 50s that would suggest that there would be such a revolution, such a change in value structures as happened during the 1960s. So, so I would say, um, Hang on to hope. You don't know when that pendulum might swing. Um, we're sort of due for a societal change, according to sociologists. It's kind of unusual that there hasn't been more of a, a, of a shift in, in values. So um, you can't know what's coming around the corner. And I would just add that, um, as you said, Dylan, you, you had not experienced this before. 
there are so many resources now for telling mm. the alternative story, which is our legacy. Uh, try out Global Nonviolent Action Database, globalnonviolentactiondatabase.org, Global Nonviolent Action Database. Org. I've been looking for this forever, and George Lakey, a wonderful nonviolence trainer, and, and his students at Swarthmore College in, in Pennsylvania created this. They put up 630 cases of nonviolent campaigns for justice in this country and around the world, and they're adding two, three, four, five a week to that database. We need this database because we're, we're in a culture that does not want us to see what Kathy showed us or want us to hear that actually nonviolence has worked twice as much as violent ones, according to the um, great book, uh, Why Civil Resistance Works by uh, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stephan. Get that book if you, if you can. And finally, um, uh, uh, there's a really wonderful website called wagingnonviolence.org uh, and every day, uh, it serves up examples of ordinary people like ourselves actually making change. This is crucial to dissolving the myth of redemptive violence in our own spirits, but also in our, in our society. We have a history, and it's very important to learn the nonviolent history because, like I said, we're coming to the crossroads. We're going to need all the help we can get. Thank you. Just... One last thing, Kathy, did you want to mention anything about the fast this week? Oh, yes, you know, um, thank you very much. Uh, there are prisoners in Guantanamo who are heading into, well, now it would be their seventh week of a hunger strike. And uh, some of them are being, for eight case, in eight cases, they're being force fed. Um, several of them have diabetes, so it, it is life risking. There, um, beginning Sunday on the 24th, um, a number of us with, with the Witness Against Torture campaign will begin a week-long fast and public vigil in Washington, D.C., Chicago, um, New York, and San, uh, sorry, Los Angeles, and um, I think possibly some other places, and maybe here in South Bend, if any of you would like to come together and be part of that, um, either fasting for seven days, although I don't recommend that to younger people whose bodies are developing, but um, uh, maybe a rotating fast, what, you know, one day apiece, and some kind of public vigil. Uh, you could go to Witness Against Torture to that website and um, find out more about it. Uh, there's still time to sign up and certainly to flood Guantanamo base with letters. If they, so that there's some, awareness in the base that there is a, um, a kind of an oversight, a civil society oversight going on. Thank you for that. Um, and I would just add, if you want to do something for peace, have Kathy Kelly come to your community and share her life and stories. Somebody, I, I was at a conference once, got up and said, when I was 12 years old, I wanted to become the American Gandhi. Then I found out it was Kathy Kelly. <laughs> so. It's Zach Rula. Join me in thanking Kathy and Ken. Thank you. And now we have a break.